Romans chapter 12. And it's entitled, A Living Sacrifice. Romans chapter 12. Starting in verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all of the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouraging, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be to devoted one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of the low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it is, depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And that's our spiritual... Uh, our scripture this morning, is there a children's church? Okay, there's no children, so we'll continue on. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Hi. It's good to see you. You're welcome here. We had a nice trip. We took our little motor home and drove to Tri-Cities and stayed with this special family we know down there. Then drove on to Maupin, Oregon the next day to attend the wedding of our, one of our grandsons. We were proud of all of our grandsons. They're doing so well. He's just graduated from Oregon State University. He has a degree in mechanical engineering. And uh, when he did his apprenticeship work, he worked for Erickson Helicopters just outside of Medford. And then uh, as soon as he graduated, they snatched him up and hired him. And uh, he's tickled to death with his job. Uh, He walked right in behind the guy that had just left who had headed up the research group on the fiber stuff that you make those wings with. They, uh, they want to make them better and stronger and able to do more, I guess, or whatever. And so he's jumping right into that project, and he's very, very happy with it. And uh, he married into a family that's very Christian. Dad's a doctor. Grandpa's a preacher. And the grandpa before that, was that he a preacher? Yeah, they're preachers. Preachers are doctors, one of those two. And uh, the man that married them, his grandpa, her grandpa, was uh, uh, a research 
writer. He has written several books. One of them that caught my interest was that he had gone to where they are and researched original copies of our Bible. You know, archaeologists in the last, oh, I suppose, hundred years (laughs) have found a lot of these things. And he was into our uh, translations and all of that. He'd be a fascinating man to compare our different translations to Ron. You'd really enjoy listening to him. Then the next day we had to decide whether we would go home or go to Portland. And we, ah, maybe we'll go home. Well, let, let's drive to the last place where we can turn right and go home, or turn left and go to Portland. We went there and called everybody again. Nobody's home. No, we're not going to be this close again. Let's go to Portland. So we went there and visited some of our friends. Had a great time. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Sanctify. In that form is a verb. And it isn't a word we use nowadays. And that's why I used it. The scripture uses the same idea and calls it consecration. Calls it separate unto. And we're talking about What happens to a human being when they come to faith in Jesus Christ and now know their sins are forgiven, they're right in their heart with God, now the next thing is to sanctify (laughs) The next thing is to realize that he not only is my Savior, he's my Lord. And right at this point in time, way, way too much emphasis is put on not doing that, not doing that, not doing something else, not doing that. I can't do that anymore. If the church group you're going to has a certain set of mores, of rights and wrongs, that's what you better adhere to if you're going to be accepted there. And so we get off on the wrong foot right away, very easily. We need to get off on a different foot, which is, what can I do now? Now that I am a Christian... Now that I I have been forgiven, now that I have power at my hand to be totally everything, whether possible or impossible, what can I do? (laughs) What do you want me to do, Lord? I'm ready to do something for you. I don't care what people around me think. I'm more concerned with what you think. And I want to be pleasing to you every day. And I learned a little trick. When I become tempted to do what I used to do, because as an unbeliever, I like to do that, I need to realize that at that moment of temptation, I need to replace that temptation with something else that is good. For instance, if you're an alcoholic, and this has been pointed out to you by the Lord, it's something you shouldn't do anymore. You drive down the street, right by Northwoods, (laughs) there in Naples. Well, I could stop there, Lord, and have some time with my friends. I used to sit there and talk with them a long time. But you know what? 
the Lord will let you know if you ask him. There's somebody on over there on that other road that would love to have a visit. Share the word, share prayer. In that way, you aren't saying no only. You're saying yes. And you're able to do something that takes the place of what you used to do. And I'm just wanting to encourage you to do that. In the areas of your temptation, very personal temptation. You don't share this with anybody, probably. Here is where we have the fight against temptation. And may I suggest to you the way to win is to fill that space with Scripture, fill that space with helping others where they need it. Amen? We have a special couple with us today. I remember Troy, Troy Roberts and his wife, Cora. I remember Troy, Troy when he was in high school. He was very active. He would denounce the players on the ball team. And he'd say, now, you know, a lot better than I did. I mean, maybe he'll do it for you here. I don't know. <laughs> and the next thing I knew about him, he was getting kind of fond on this Cora. We kind of knew her before. And she talked to him, I guess. I don't know how he got there. He went to a chrysalis, a teenage chrysalis, like a walk to uh, walk with Christ like we go to here. And uh, at that time, they would have an enactment of the crucifixion. They'd have a big cross, about six feet by ten feet, Four feet, a pretty good sized cross. One man would be all you'd want to carry it. And they would strip somebody who volunteered down to just the minimum, get him to carry that cross, walk beside and yell at him and scream at him and hit him with whips, come up in front of the church, have him get down on that cross and tie his arms to that cross or make like they're driving nails, you know, just the other side of the cross. And then lift him up and let him fall in the hole. And he'd hang like this for a few moments. When Troy saw that, he said, now's the time to give my heart to Jesus. I have a very beautiful memory of that in my mind. But, you know, I can get confused. So I went back and checked to make sure I was thinking about this right guy. Oh, yeah, I was there. And so I want him to come up now, and, and uh, I'll give the lapel, lapel mic to him, and uh, he can take over and, and give us the message that's on his heart. I'm tickled to death to share it with you. Well, that wasn't me. <laughs> <Just kidding. clears throat> Actually, it was. I've, uh, <laughs> when uh, Lowell first came up and he's like, I remember you since high school. My first thought was I got saved at 17 and a lot happened before that. So I was like, uh, I hope you don't remember certain things I remember. Um, <clears throat> my youth, I almost feel like I need to explain the rest of the story. I might take just a moment. By the way, what's, what's the respectful amount of time I should be using here? When you get done, I quit. Okay. All right, Who, so let me ask a more meaningful question. Who's got a pot roast at home, and what's the timer say, right? No, probably not. Okay, well, let me get this thing together, and we'll get started. I think I'm going to the Middle East now. All right. <laughs> yeah, I will. We'll get there. All right. Does that work? I feel like I'm a little far. Yeah. We'll go all the way up. All right, to, to kind of fill in that story a little bit, um, I was definitely not a believer through my high school experience until I was 17 years old, and uh, Cora told me the gospel over and over and over, and crying late nights on the phone, and I am thick-headed, but uh, part of the reason I was thick-headed is um, I was in a circle of friends, and 
I'm trying, I'm just, okay, let, let me do this from the beginning. In 10th uh, grade, I was in a biology class, and I was kind of a math, still am, a math science geek. And uh, we had this discussion about evolution. I wasn't a believer. I didn't even know about Genesis 1. I knew about Noah and the ark. That was about it. Um, but we started having this conversation about evolution. And from a science perspective, I said, wait a minute, from, from physical science, I have some issues. How do we get this? And, and I kind of accidentally started a debate. Well, a whole bunch of people were like, yeah, yeah, all right, what he said. And afterwards, I'm like, so why didn't you guys help me out? And it turned out they were all Mormons. And they said, well, we, we believe what it says in the Book of Mormon in the Bible. And, and I'm like, that's not really helpful here. So I kind of blew that off. But secretly, I went back. So thank you to the Mormons. I went back and I read Genesis 1, 2, 3, 4. I actually went up all the way through about 11. And then it got a little weird. And so I put it away. But that stuck with me. And it was an interesting depiction of how we all got here. I think it is now the absolute truth down to the detail. Um, it's been cool that that was kind of how I started. I mean, I, I got partially saved by Genesis 1. Um, and then I met Cora and several other people, started to see that uh, drinking and partying weren't actually the things I wanted by the end of it. Um, so then Cora comes into my life, and I start realizing that, like, she's fairly attractive and remains so today. Uh, so we started having a lot of long conversations. I did end up eventually reading a bunch of the Bible kind of on my own. I even went to what was the Praise Church at one time. My picture of church was, I need to dress up and look decent. This is a respectful environment. I showed up in a shirt and tie, and I had outdressed the pastor that day. So that was a mistake. Uh, it was so embarrassing. I ran to the bathroom, took the tie off, and it's still, I still outdressed the pastor. The guy was in a shirt and shorts, and it was crazy. So I felt totally embarrassed. I didn't come back for a while, but I did go back. And so I was starting to get in there. I didn't tell anybody because I didn't want anybody knowing. Um, I had a, a reputation to uphold. Eventually... Cora's conversation started to hit home. I started reading. I eventually read the Gospel of John, which was really powerful in my life. And then finally, at that crucifixion reenactment, I kind of decided, if Jesus is willing to do this for me, I can lose some reputation and friends uh, over him. And I did. I, uh, I lost most of my friends and kind of rebuilt, starting with my junior year. Um, I found out that I, I wasn't okay anymore with being a civil engineer for the money. and decided I was going to be a teacher for the relationships with real people. Um, so he changed my whole life in the course of about six months as a junior at the, uh, 17 years old. And he's been uh, messing up all of my well-laid plans ever since. So I'd like to uh, share a little bit with you. Um, if there's time at the end, I'll share a little bit from Scripture. And so many things. Romans 12, I love. It's unbelievable. We could spend weeks on that chapter alone. But let us at least tell you uh, what the Lord's been leading us in. And then uh, I'll let my wife get in here. And then if there's time, I'll, I'll share. Something that I thought was powerful from just Romans 12 was really cool. So uh, just, just to introduce ourselves, go ahead and give us a click. Oh, look at that. You guys have monitors all over the place. <laughs> if, uh, and by the way, I don't know if you guys think, is it Stephen Logan, right? I don't know if you think the tech guy. I've been the tech guy. It is a hard, thankless job. And somebody's like, play this and then play that. And here's a video. And you're like, <laughs> no. And you eventually get it. But the fact that they're back there doing it for me, I truly appreciate it. So thanks, guys. Um, click it one more time. Here's us. I uh, explained the legend. Here's a picture to explain. That's Cora's ASB card from 9899. There's some embarrassment. She's, Kim, Kim remembers me that way. Yeah, right. That, that's the last memory. And uh, that's me in eighth grade playing basketball at the junior high or what was the junior high at one time. I'm, I'm the one that puberty found first in the back row. Huge. I'm still the same height. I've been the same size since 14. It's terrible. All right, go ahead and give us another click. And I'll, I'll let Cora explain what we've been doing. Should I hold this thing, or do you want me to take this? We can share this. All right, this is cool. This will be our mic. Okay. Well, um, yeah, if you'd click again, it's going to zoom in on that star one more time. That's Pilot Point, Alaska. That's where we spent the last four years teaching. Prior to that, we spent three years in another little village called Chignik Lake. Um, we were extremely blessed during our time there to see a few youth actually come to Christ and grow in their relationship with the Lord. Here you see Michael on the right and Waylon in the middle. I'd like to share with you Waylon's story um, just as an example of how God can use teaching. We met Waylon four years ago when he was this scrawny freshman. Uh, He had just come back from summer camp, and he'd given his heart to the Lord. He'd been baptized but he really had no idea what that meant, what following Christ entailed, and there was no church in his village. And this is a small village, 50, 60 people, a school of about 12 kids, 
kindergarten through 12th grade. And so I was Wayland's cross-country coach, Troy was Wayland's high school teacher, basketball coach, student government advisor, everything. And um, we decided to start a Bible study in our home on Sundays with another couple there to, you know, try to reach out to the youth that had heard about Christ or like Waylon had made a commitment to Christ or were just interested in something to do. And um, Waylon came sometimes and sometimes he didn't. We watched him over the years kind of struggle on and off with peer influences, um, difficulties at home, academics. But the Lord kept working on him, and we were thankful to be there in his life at that critical time of development. Um, Each summer, he went back to the Bible camp that he'd given his heart to the Lord in, and we were able to sponsor him through the donations of some of our sponsors to go to Bible camp, which was a huge blessing for him because each time he came back, more and more grounded in his faith and more on fire in the Lord. And, in fact, this last year, he got to go spend his senior year of high school in that um, village where the camp is set in a pastor's home, and he really grew again there. And so we got to see um, how Waylon went from really not knowing much about Christ or what it meant to follow him to this last year, we heard him give his testimony in front of a group of 70 of his peers at a regional youth gathering. And, you know, it's just really been a blessing. And Waylon, he will outright tell you how significant we, and particularly Troy, has been in his walk with Christ. Um, he, the day we left Pilot Point was a very sad day to get on that airplane and hug these kids goodbye, not knowing when we would see them again. And Waylon put a post on Facebook that I want to share with you uh, just because it, it shares his heart and the beauty of the connections that could be made through teaching. He said, For the past four years, I've been stuck with this guy, and he inserted, like, five very unflattering pictures of Troy. (laughs) And they've been the greatest. He's probably the guy I look up to most. He has helped me through so much stuff, and I will never forget him, helping me become a better basketball player, a more active and fun person, a better man, and just helping me become more of a loving, more of a God-loving man. He and his family left today not knowing when we would see each other again, but one day, if it's not on this earth, then it will be home where we belong. Troy Roberts, love you, man, and just thank you so much for everything you've done for me. So, obviously, he's a special kid to our hearts, and if you'd like to continue praying for Waylon, please do. <laughs> um, but that is just, just a blessing to see that God can use teaching, you know, in a public school setting in this instance, to build those types of connections and relationships that can lead to authentic discipleship. Yeah, the hard part is that Cora reads this every time we talk to churches and it's terrible <laughs> uh, there I don't know how to exp- I didn't understand it I know there are some teachers that that impacted my life along the way and I I would imagine every one of you has had a teacher along the way that has significantly impacted your life um, I don't know if it was for Christ or not but it is incredible the power you have those kids spend more time with me than they do their parents most of them uh, I just uh that's it's something I've never taken lightly and that the Lord has used. And uh, please know that story about Waylon is a testimony to the greatness of God. And not, <laughs> uh, not necessarily anything I've done or, or any talent I have. It's, it's just been obedience. And I think Lowell said it well. is like, what can I do? Um, to be actively looking for what it is that I can do with what the Lord has given me, the resources, the time, the money, the energy, the talents. And, and how can I invest that in a way that it will give back forever into eternity. And, and that's, that was the whole change. I mentioned it as a kid. I wanted to be a civil engineer because I thought great money, you know, I'd get to travel around. And then I was like, wait, after I got saved, I was like, I want to have a family. I want to engage with that family. I want to work with people and know people because that's how I can express Jesus best is let them see my life and then share the life I have within me that is Christ. And that happens through teaching. It happens so well. I think it's just automatic discipleship. It's almost like missionary cheating. It's just not fair. I I see normal missionaries, and they have to come in, and they're like, well, I'm an airplane mechanic, and oh, I fixed planes for this one guy, and we worked together that one day for two hours. And that's like what they get to write home about. I worked with a guy for two hours, and we shared personally. And I'm like, I share personally with eight teenagers every single day for eight hours a day. And, and for seven years, the state of Alaska paid me to do it. That's crazy. It's cheating. So if, if you know any teachers, they should be going to Alaska and you know, making more money than you need and serving the Lord with their entire day and their whole life. 
And, and I love it. I love it. And, and that's what makes this moment in my life really tough, is that uh, we would have happily lived the rest of our lives, well, most of it anyway, in Alaska. Um, we have family here, so I have to be, grandma's in the stands, I have to be careful what I say. But we have, we have, we have loved Alaska, and we feel like the Lord has so much more that he wants to do there, yet we're going to Thailand. And, and there's a lot to say about why we're doing that, but we believe wholeheartedly that the Lord is leading us in this change. Ever since college, we've had this itch to be involved in international missions among unreached people groups. And we could have stayed in Alaska and given money to missionaries to go in our place, but we've seen that this, this place, this, uh, what, what we'll call Cricks, it's the Chiang Rai International Christian School, there is a way for us to invest our lives that... Definitely the Lord has led us to it, and if any of you are interested in the story, I'll spare all of you, but you can ask us and we'll explain how the Lord's led us to Thailand and Chiang Rai International Christian School. But there is a a position there for us that I think maximizes our lives for Jesus. I I don't think at this moment, I don't know of any option that can make us more effective for his kingdom, his glory, than this school right now. So I'll kind of let... Uh, I, well, I kind of want to pitch Thailand, and then I'll let you take over. Um, Thailand, I don't know what you know about it. It sounds like you guys know a lot, because I think the Brinkmans, go ahead and click once for us. The, the Brinkmans are sponsored through you guys, or at least supported by you in prayer and potentially giving. And it sounds like they're working with the Free Burma Rangers, which we know some folks that do that out of uh, actually Port Allsworth, where that Bible camp is. And it's an amazing ministry going into this war-torn area. We're a little, a little east of where they are, and uh, you can see that star up at the top. It's Chiang Rai. Um, Thailand is an interesting nation. It is very unreached. In fact, by percentage of Christian, it is the least reached nation in Southeast Asia. That means of about 14 major nations, of which you all know the name, I'm sure, it is the least reached. In fact, if you look at the listings for unreached nations, it is 11th in unreached nations in the entire world. Now, that seems crazy because last year they had 27 million tourists. How do you get 27 million foreigners and yet, you have less than 1% of your population are believing in, in Jesus in any form. And we're talking about um, every single person that might affiliate with Jesus in any way. If you add them all up, you get seven-tenths of a percent of 67 million people. Thailand desperately needs the gospel, but 27 million people from Western nations are dropping in there every year. So why isn't it getting done? Well, a lot of the missionaries that are coming into Thailand such as Free Burma Rangers, they're going to Burma. They're going to Laos. They're going to southern China. Chiang Rai is only a little, about 100 miles from China. And all these people are using Chiang Mai as a jumping point for missions because Chiang Mai is safe. But what they're doing is some of us, and I I support their work wholeheartedly and may God use them and serve uh, the kingdom in that. But we're also jumping over unreached people groups. In fact, Thailand has 83 unreached people groups. Can you even imagine that? 83 unreached people groups in Thailand. In percentage of Christians, number 10 in the at least least percentage of Christians is the Islamic Republic of Iran. Iran is 10. Right behind it is Thailand. So there's a great need in Thailand. Um, I'll let Cora explain a little bit about Chiang Rai School specifically. So if you give us another click, we're going to zoom in on Chiang Rai, and you'll see a picture here of um, a chapel service at Crick's as Troy said it's called, and we're very excited about going to serve there because, as he mentioned, we have um, the potential to really maximize our our calling, our gifting, our lives to spread the gospel. So there is immense need in northern Thailand, and there are people there working. They're reaching out to the refugees. They have orphanages. They're going to these unreached hill tribe groups. They're doing HIV-AIDS hospice because 1% of all Thai adults have AIDS. Um, There's a lot of outreach going on, and these families need somebody to teach their kids, or they could homeschool their kids, but of course, you know, not everybody's equipped to do that, and it can take away from what they might want to be accomplishing in ministry. Or they could send their kids to a Thai school, which is not a great option because the education system there is really, really bad. Or they could send their kids to the really, really, really expensive international school, but what missionary can afford to do that? So Crix was created to serve these servants. So that's their motto, serving the servants. These families that are up there ministering for the gospel, their kids can go to Crix at a very reasonable rate. And so we get to go and serve 
these servants as teachers by enabling the families to stay on the field, by providing them quality education. So that's one of the first things that we're excited about about Cricks. And then number two is just like we mentioned with Waylon, that, that intentional relationship and that discipleship that can, have it, that can happen through the parent or, well, <laughs> we're kind of going to be parents because we're going to have a friend come stay with us, and she's going to go to school there for a semester. So we'll have that, too. But through the teacher-student relationship, um, so there'll be discipleship happening, we hope, Lord willing. And then Cricks is also intentional about evangelism, so they reserve 30% of their student population for Thai national students. So 30% of the kids that come to this Christian school are from Buddhist homes, and that means just outright telling them about Jesus, sharing the love of Christ with them, showing them what that means for the first time in their lives, and then they get to share that with their families. So we're really excited about these possibilities. Um, There's a video, if you're able to start that up, that students at Cricks made a great nine-minute video, and we crunched it down to two minutes for you, um, that just kind of encapsulates what what it's all about. get much more exciting than being able to reach out to those kids and just speak God's love into their lives. So again, we're thrilled that God's given us this opportunity to serve the servants of those families, to, (laughs) there's our little one, to disciple their children and to evangelize those Thai students who come to Cricks. If you didn't meet them, excuse me, if you didn't meet them, this is Channon. I don't know. I think we have a confusion. We think we're Jewish or something, but we named our kid Hebrew names. Uh, Shannon is, means grace or sometimes mercy uh, from the Old Testament, and Rinna means shout for joy, which she's starting to live up to. So. All right. If Oh, actually, yeah. I, I'm explaining what I need, but then the last part's you. Sorry, we're getting this worked out. Um, the hard part about uh, going overseas is that, well, it's overseas. Um, it's a long ways away. It takes a lot to get there. Um, it takes a lot of prayer support to ever think you're going to be effective cross-culturally. And, and that's really our need base. Um, we desperately need people to pray for us, and that's why we're here. We desperately need people that will support us so we can stay there. Um, as I mentioned, we had a job for seven years, which I just quit. <laughs> that's usually not a good career plan. But I don't have a job now. I'm relying entirely on other people to support us. And within ministry... Um, some of you have already been praying for us, and thank you so much for that. And some of you, we'd love to have you regularly pray for us because the job is getting bigger and harder. 
in serving the Lord. And I think that's how he works. Uh, as we're faithful with a little, he gives us a little more and a little more and a little more. And we feel like this is our little more. And so we're asking that, uh, especially people from Bonners Ferry. We know people in uh, Minnesota and Alaska, but people that we know from our hometown, especially those of you we already know and you know us, it's so meaningful to have you pray for us and to give. So our needs are prayer. We'll take as many of you as we can get. If all of you want to pray for us, that would be great. <laughs> but um, as far as the uh, physical felt need, we do need to raise this first year 3300 each month. We're at about 10% now with a couple of uh, friends that have said they want to sponsor us, but they haven't set a number yet, so we're not sure. But we only have two months to do that. Usually a missionary will take six months to two years. Um, we're trusting the Lord for a short amount of time. And in order to do that, we are also paying part of our way this year. Um, we have a savings. We've been saving up because we wish to adopt. And since the Lord's led us to Thailand, we want to adopt from Thailand, if that's possible, as we live there and adjust to the culture. So we've got a savings, and we're willing to use that to stay because we believe firmly God's calling us to Thailand. Um, but that takes away from our opportunity later to adopt. So we're trying to raise as much money as we can to meet that full support so we can not only stay in Thailand, but hopefully adopt uh, Thai child or maybe children depends on who wins the conversation but um so that's kind of our need if there is um if there is any other thing that people could think of we're always open to creativity because the lord works in a body and i wanted to go back to that thought that was already read this morning from uh, romans 12 i love the okay the first part is just because i love it i'm going to read it but i want to get down to the body portion verse well let me not do this yet i want to let you finish so do you want to do the pray give part real quick before I read? Sure. <laughs> Sorry, get this thing adjusted. Um, okay, so if you've been listening to us and you've felt God maybe is urging you, yeah, I want to pray for these guys, I want to help them out, um, there's a couple ways you can do that. I, we've got little, like, click and it'll say pray. Um, we have prayer cards in the back. Um, and if we get your information, we can send you our prayer updates. That'll just happen whenever there's prayer needs via email. We also will have a, about every two weeks, be putting a blog up with prayer requests. So you can subscribe to that. Um, and then quarterly, we'll send out a newsletter that will include prayer requests. So if you'd like to get on any of those lists, you know, talk to us. We'll sign you up. We'd love to keep in contact and let you know what the Lord's doing and um, get your prayers because it doesn't matter how great we think we are, which we really don't, but no matter how much human effort we put into it, only the power of God is going to change people's lives and is going to drive the darkness out of Thailand. So that's that's crucial. We need prayer. Um, also, as Troy mentioned, we need funds to stay there. So go ahead and click if you want to join our giving team. Um, we've got a brochure that... Um, has information on the back how you can join our giving team or you can do it through our website which we also have that it's just sendtheroberts.org um and finally the last button is tell if you want to just tell folks hey yeah you know you know you know about the need in thailand right do you want to help these guys out i mean if you want to use word of mouth or post our um website if you've got a facebook or your own blog or anything like that if you want to be spreading the word about what god's doing in thailand how he might be able to use us there that's another way that you can join our team and help um help us out so that's um that's about it for (laughs) for for what we've got except troy apparently has more that he wants to share of course is going to get on me i always always overdo things but sometimes i just feel like the Lord lines things up in a way that you can't avoid, and, and we ought to be faithful. Um, in, in that thought, if I can back up for just a second, the idea of do what you can with what you have. It really is about obedience, and I think it could be so beautiful. It could be so beautiful. I'm going to kind of just share something with you that years ago impacted me and made me feel like I need to be trying, that it's not enough just to sit and wait. Um, I was reading scripture, and I'd I'd read the Great Commission in Matthew 28, and hearing this, go and make disciples, and Colossians 1 says, him we proclaim, speaking about Jesus after this great long list of all the glories of Christ. And, And I started realizing, like, this isn't a regular part of my life. And here I was at a Bible college. And what I was doing is I was reading and studying the Bible and enjoying it and soaking it in and worshiping at these big churches. I went to John Piper's church for a while and wore that like a badge, like, I'm in John Piper's church. Um, all these things, though, 
I realized I wasn't obeying some of the most clear and central issues in the Bible, which is tell people about Jesus because there is a real hell to which people are sent. It was made for the devil and his angels, but people go there when they follow him. That's the funny thing about following people. When you follow someone, you end up where they end up. And the same is true of the devil. The hardest part for us as believers in Christ is that we've got a very narrow road that leads only to Jesus, nothing else that we have to point people down. And the devil can aim you any of the other 359 de- degrees, any direction he wants, as long as it's not the narrow road that leads to Christ. Any other road is fine in his opinion because they're all his and they all lead to his future home. And I don't want that for anybody. And I started thinking about that, but I, c- I can't always consume the Bible, just raw Bible. I can't just read it and be like, wow, that really hit home in my 2000 culture. It didn't sit. So I thought about it at the time, you know, I'd buy... Cora flowers. We couldn't buy her flowers in Alaska, so that's kind of went. But, ladies, just for a second, how many of you would appreciate if someone brought you flowers? Can you just wave at me? How many would you appreciate? Like, okay, that would be all right. I'm not trying to get the guys in trouble. All the dudes are like, what are you doing to me? Yeah, how many of you appreciate that, though? Give me a wave so I can see. Okay, so, anybody not like flowers? I don't think so. <laughs> you know, from the guy's perspective, we're probably like, it's a waste of money. They just die in a couple of days. But, it's nice. It's, it's a symbol that says, you know, I appreciate you, I love you, I enjoy you. I don't know what it says, but ask the guy in your life. Let's just take it from the perspective of marriage. Ladies, you've got um, some friends coming over, and there's this dish you make. You probably all have that dish. And they're like, oh, will you please make that when we come over tonight? And you go to start making it, and they're going to be here in about three hours. And you realize, oh, I completely ran out of two ingredients. And you send your husband. That's usually what wives do. Quick, go, get this. I need it right away. He goes... <clears throat> comes back a few minutes later, you're waiting for him, you're kind of doing some other things, cleaning house, because you always think your house is dirty and you're wrong. And he comes back, you hear him, <clears throat> he comes in, he's got that look on his face, that goofy look when you know he's about to pitch something that doesn't make any sense. But he pulls out flowers. Ladies, what do you have to say at that moment? Go ahead, you, you, all, you all can talk. Yeah, right. What are you apologizing for? Any other thoughts coming to mind? Do you have the ingredients? Yeah, you guys are very nice. The last church we were in, like, you idiot. (laughs) But yeah, that's the general idea. Didn't you just tell me you wanted flowers? I mean, some of you were like, yeah, I like that. would be nice. We, we all want to be appreciated. We all want it to be loved. But when you need something, you expect to be obeyed. Right? When you make a specific request. Well, I thought about that and I shared it with Cora and I thought, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing with my life. I'm offering the Lord Jesus flowers. I'm reading his Bible and understanding and soaking up and enjoying it. I'm worshiping and that is good. Let me tell you, offering flowers to a girl in your life will never go badly. You just also have to show up with the ingredients. Or it will go badly. And I thought about that in the context of Christ and my following of him and my worship of him and my reading of him. And it just, it wasn't enough. It wasn't an obedience because I wasn't doing what he was telling me to. So I got involved with ministries. I started practicing sharing my faith. I had plenty of excitement, but I was terrible at it. I've gotten better and better with practice over the years. But I want to encourage you in the same way. That if you're reading the Bible, please continue. If you worship the Lord with a whole heart and with joy, please continue. Just please also know that it's kind of already been said in the idea of sanctification is that what is coming into you will come out of you. Your God will be worshipped by you. That's not your choice. Here's what I mean. You will worship your God because you will talk about he or it or she or whatever. You will talk about it. You will live about it. You will sometimes sing about it. But I can look at your life and I could probably tell you what your God is. You could look at mine and tell me what my God is. Every one of us is worshiping and that's where sanctification comes in. That, that sanctification idea has at its core the word saint, sanctus, right? That's where the word comes from. The idea of making you a saint and saint has its roots in the word holy. Holy means set apart for the Lord, set apart for God. That's the idea. Every one of us that knows Christ is a saint. And in fact, in Colossians 1, we are told that this great mystery has been revealed to the Gentiles and it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then he says, him we proclaim. 
the foundation on which the Apostle Paul, Paul himself, and if ever, if ever there's been a zealous dude, it was Paul. What's the foundation on which he builds his great zeal, his great power and effectiveness? He says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim. Two verses later, he says, for that goal, proclaiming Jesus, for that goal I strive with all his might which is at work in me. So why was Paul amazing at sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because Christ lived in him. Paul's point was Christ lives in you. There is no difference between you and the Apostle Paul on the spiritual level. That's a, that's a, a crazy thing to say. But every one of us, myself included, even my children, small children, when they receive Jesus Christ and they trust in him to save them from the hell that the devil is hoping to drag you to, but I hope he fails, that same Holy Spirit that was in Paul is in us and can do anything he wants at any time he wants. He can provide $3,300 a month. He could single-handedly save Bonner's Ferry in the course of a weekend if he felt like it. But in his sovereignty, he doesn't do that because he is designed for himself, the presence of his son, the Holy Spirit, to live in you so that you and me will do it. That's crazy. Romans 1.16 says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who will believe. I mean, envision if you had this huge syringe and it had 10 shots worth in it and this crazy man came up to you and said, this is the cure for cancer. I've been in the Amazon for five years. Take it. Do well. And he leaves. Well, first, I think he's nuts. All right. And I'd probably put it in a closet. But let's run the scenario that you had a loved one or a friend that was, that was dying of cancer. I've had that. You've probably had that. If you had something in a last ditch effort, I would have tried it for the one I loved. I would have tried it because you know what's going to happen anyway. If it cured them of cancer, would we then put it back in the closet? No way. If we knew we had the cure for cancer in our hands, we would run rampant to the news. We would find scientists to duplicate it. And it would be sick. And I don't use that word lightly. It would be disgusting if you died and that was still full. If you can understand what I'm saying. If you held in your hand the cure for cancer and didn't offer it to anybody... I mean, I think that would put us on the level of Jeffrey Dahmer and Marilyn Manson. These people have done great harm in the history of people. If you have such great power as the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation to anyone who might believe, anyone, and we end our lives not having shared that cure, then no offense intended, and I love each of you as a brother and sister in Christ, but know that that is sick. We have to share we have to. Um, I, I got to be a firefighter over the Forest Service for years, and that, that fire angle was kind of another way I understood this. And I thought about, what if I were, and this is my college years when I was, again, struggling with, I'm not obeying, I'm not obeying. I was too scared to share. And I kept thinking about, as a firefighter, what if I showed up to a fire and a house was burning? It's maybe an apartment building in Minneapolis, and this apartment building's burning up. I pull up to the fire And I pull out my phone or my laptop or I sit back and I even read my Bible or a book as the building burns. Now, lots of people, this is not a great thought, lots of people watch building burn. We watch accidents. For something about us is drawn to the horror that is life sometimes. But there is a big difference between when a bystander comes by and says, oh no, that building's on fire. And when a firefighter comes up in an equipment truck equipped for putting out fires with all the gear and years of training. And he says, oh, no, look, that building's on fire. The bystander, that person, we don't have a problem with. But if I saw a fire truck next to a burning building and the guys inside were playing a game and looking, talking on the phone, I would be irate out of my mind. I would be telling them, you have everything you need to help these people. What are you doing? And I told that same thing to myself, that Romans 1.16, again, the power of God for salvation to everyone who would believe. I have everything I need to tell people the knowledge that they may choose to believe and save their souls. I have that. I'm not the bystander watching a world burn. I'm the firefighter watching the world burn. And over and over, I found analogies that convicted me, and and Scripture challenged me over and over again. And and the one that's been hitting me the most now is how I'll end with you. It's the widow's might. And every one of you knows that story. Poor widow. She walks into the temple, drops in a few coins, and Jesus says she gave more than everyone. And yay. But 
I don't think that hits us. I, that one is already, I can feel that already. Because imagine where she was. She was in the second court of the temple, which is the area in which you give. There are these big kind of trumpet cylinder things that you throw your money in. And the scripture tells us that there are many people there already. Now, this was a big event. Many religious people, many rich people showed up and everyone watched you give. Could you imagine if people were looking over your shoulder every time you gave money? (sighs) Now, all of a sudden, it's about reputation. Reputation. Imagine what the widow felt. What's her motivation when she walks through this crowd of rich people and religious people, walks up to the trumpet of offering, and drops in her two little tiny coins that amounts to less than a penny today? And then she walks away. Now, it doesn't tell us in Scripture, but I wonder if anybody had anything to say. Or often, the ugliest things we say are unsaid, aren't they? There are things that we just, it's a look we gave her. It's the way we made her feel. It's that the crowd parted a little bit farther when she came. And everybody watched as she gave. And the scripture says that she put in her, some translations will say everything she had. Some will say livelihood. The Greek word there is bios. For those of you that know science, biology, bio means life. What was literally said in that is she put her life in. And, uh, (laughs) sorry. I wonder if it was less about the coins. I wonder if Jesus watched that whole thing. And I like to do this. I like to be in a, in a large group of people and just pray and watch people and wonder what the Lord is doing in their life. But Jesus is watching her. And if you go back to the scripture and read it, he pulls his disciples to himself. He says, you 12 who follow me everywhere and trust everything I say, but don't do a very good job of it. Come here for a second. Come here for a second. Watch this woman. And among all the religious, among all the rich and the large amounts of money that were put in, he pointed to her. Are you kidding? Like you pointed to this woman who had nothing to offer the temple? You can't build a temple off the money she offered. So what did she offer? She offered her life. Obviously, this one still works. <laughs> uh, give me a second. She walked up not with coins, but with a reputation and with shame on her head. And with all the other people looking, Jesus said, you look too. But with a different perspective. It wasn't you look and see that she has little to give. It's you look and remember this. And for thousands of years, people have been telling the story of this woman wrong, I think. It had nothing to do with the money, in my opinion. It had to do with the life that she risked to go there and to be shamed in the place that should have been the house of God. And people wonder why Jesus braided a rope and whipped everyone out of the temple. Because they and their money changing had chosen a different God and they showed in the face of the house of God what God they worshipped. And he was right not to stand it. But there was one woman. There was at least one. And it, it really doesn't matter. Um, where I, I don't know if this is entirely scripturally true, but it's the way I feel. I don't think it matters where I serve the Lord. I just don't think it matters whether I live here the rest of my life. I don't think it matters whether I stay in Alaska. If I never make it to Thailand, I don't think that matters. But I believe the Lord is calling us to that. The Lord has pushed me toward things that have failed. And I think that failure has moved me in my faith. But right now the green light is Thailand. And I'm going to go as hard as I can. Because that's all I know from him right now. And because I refuse to offer him roses when he's given me something to do. I have to go. Now, the body portion of this is so important. The fact that the Lord has told me to go does not say anything about my worth in your eyes, in anyone else's eyes, or in the eyes of Christ. Because, bottom line, Paul says, I have Christ in me, and you have the same Christ in you. I cannot say I am any better. You cannot say I am any worse than you. The most sinful Christian has the presence of Christ within him or her. Every one of us has a place within the body to serve. And I just want to read you a little piece. Do not think more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. And therein lies the secret. How do we please God? It's by faith, by offering our life, by saying, this is all I can do. But I'm going to do it in the face of shame and pain. And I don't have enough money for the next week. That is what I'm going to do. 
For me, it was, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to leave the people I love. I'm going to take my children to a culture I don't understand and a language I can't speak. And I'm going to offer my life as long as I can. And if it costs us all of our savings, then it will cost us all of our savings. And that's okay, because I haven't even begun to get close to what that woman dropped into that small trumpet. She dropped her life in. So I have to be willing to do that, or I'm not even coming close to meeting the standard by which Jesus said, disciples, look, look at that one. And that is, it should, as a Christian, it should be the cry of our life. That if I go to Hebrews 12, it talks about the great cloud of witnesses. So many have come before us and been faithful, some faithful unto persecution, some faithful unto death. And this cloud of witnesses we're instructed, it's almost like they're watching us. And in that chapter, in, in around there, there's often that... Um, Paul talks about this kind of athletic setting that he says, I do not box as uh, shadow boxing, as fighting my shadow. He says, I do it with meaning, with hope. He talks about running with perseverance, the race marked out before us. He is setting this in an athletic setting. He's saying that we are all performing, almost like the Olympics, and the cloud of witnesses watching us. And how great, how great would it be if Jesus said, look at that one run. That's, that's it. That's all I want. And if it costs us our life, you will have traded up more than any investment you could ever imagine. There's no way to invest more than to drop your life at the throne of Christ and let it be, as was read, a living sacrifice. You know, I think if some of you, if someone walked in here right now, which happens in many countries, and they held up a gun, and they asked you to spit on, pee on, burn your Bibles... And to renounce Jesus and to follow whatever they were following. And they held a gun to your head. I think many of you would stay with Jesus and you would accept the loss of your life. Because you have life beyond life. I would hope in my heart. I don't know actually. I would like to believe that the Holy Spirit in me would be strong enough. I think he would and is. That I would accept my own death gladly to know Christ in that moment. I want to believe that. But I think this verse is actually speaking against that being, that's the easy way out. No offense to martyrs, I can't come close to that faith and I've never had that experience. But this is not speaking of a dying sacrifice, which all sacrifices do. It's speaking of as living sacrifices. Your sacrifice and your acceptance of Jesus in threat, in shame, in horror, really, It's not a momentary thing that you can say, I made the decision and it's over. Because that's what I was doing. I made the decision at that cross as your son hung on the cross. I made that decision. That wasn't the end. I became a living sacrifice by which I continually had to sacrifice and sacrifice and sacrifice and sacrifice. And on the end of my life, I will look back and I will laugh at every sacrifice that hurts. Because it just will not compare to the glory that is to be revealed when the sons of God And ladies, you are the sons of God. The reason why it says sons is because you have a great inheritance. In the Jewish culture, women did not inherit. You married into money. You are to inherit the great worth of God. And you are to inhabit the new Jerusalem on a new earth. There was so much awaited for us that it is laughable that anything causes fear within us. And the reason why it does in me is because I lack faith. And so we return, and this is where I end. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. I own you because of Christ, and you own me because of Christ. And my great hope is, whether you support us or not, support the Brinkman, support us. Uh, don't, you know, don't support, support somebody else. I don't even know. I don't care. But you need to be busy about what the Lord has given you because you are a part of the body and you do not all have the same function. I have not been called to stay home and pray at this point, but I pray. I have not been called to be only a giver, but I give. There are so many functions within the body. Some of you, if you have a missionary, you may not even know that they're discouraged. They need a letter from you. A physical thing felt so they can be encouraged. They need an email from you. You might need to call somebody, maybe your neighbor. I don't know what it is. You have a function within the body. There are so many times within the Bible where we are talked about as an army. We're expected to be soldiers. And I can't remember the book. I think it's Timothy. We're expected not to get caught up in civilian affairs. We are about the task of being in the Lord's army and reaching people with the power of God for salvation. In the actual army, in our army, If you do the numbers on frontline soldiers versus the people in the army, 
it is a ridiculously small percentage of people that are frontline soldiers. Isn't that crazy? And I know lots of people who have served in the military as not soldiers. I have friends that went around and all they did, they, they carried a gun, but all they did was they did service projects in communities in Iraq. He never once fired his weapon. I know there are people who have become accountants and, and lawyers, heaven forbid, and teachers, all in the military. There are a lot of ways in which the military needs people to serve that has nothing to do with the battle on the front line. In fact, the ratio was one to nine. For every one person on the front line, there's nine people behind. If you guys know your history, Napoleon Bonaparte says that an army marches on its stomach. The army is useless without the funds, the resources, the food, whatever it is that they need. No resource, no work. No support line, no communication line, no food line, no healthy soldiers on the front to fight. And that's all I want to be. I want to be a portion of the army. And now while it gets to be, I get to stand up here and talk about all of this, it is no better than one of you that sits at home and prays. Please pray. You are asking the God of the universe to intervene, and he's capable. And those of you that give, We have instruction to do so quietly. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Why? Because it doesn't matter what I think about your money. It has nothing. If you give me a large amount, that is great. I will praise God. But in my heart, I will try to remember that it is the giving of the life and the faith that the Lord looks upon. And I will try to look upon the $2 a month the same as the church that gives us $200 a month. Because it has to do with the matter of faith. And I hope that your faith in the Lord is so great that you cannot stop yourself from finding your particular function within the body of Christ. And I will be glad to be attached to you. Uh, There's so much more I could say, but my nose is running and I'm crying like an idiot. So I'm going to go ahead and pray. And then I'll give you this thing back before I embarrass myself some more. Uh, Lord, thank you. Um, Man, what do you say? I I don't know what to say sometimes. Thank you, Lord, for creating us. Thank you for thinking it was a good idea that we should exist, I guess. Uh, thank you that even though we've rebelled against you and we've sinned, and even, even in our faith, we have, we have not been a part of the body and we have not offered the gospel to the people we know. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for looking ahead and seeing every error of our life and 2,000 years ago offering yourself on the cross. Thank you for not calling down the angels and jumping off because that's what we deserved. Thank you for taking taking that from us. I pray for Thailand. I I know there are many other places in the world that people in here have burdens for. I pray for each one of those places that you would put people in the front lines and that you would support them by an entire body that is your body and of which you are the head. And we love you. Thank you again. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen, if you agree. Thanks. You know, it's just as awesome for us to watch Troy and Cora as it is for them.